Welcome to the Launchpad Podcast. In 1975, after struggling to warrant mainstream success over their first three studio albums, KISS took a huge gamble making one of the first ever live rock albums. The record entitled KISS Alive would allow the band to capture their vibe and deliver their brand of rock and roll to audiences worldwide. It would eventually go quadruple platinum and be one of the biggest records in the band's history. However, after the success of Kiss Alive, the elephant in the room was if this band could finally pull off a studio record that would reach beyond just their own cult following. Kiss sought out a new producer, the legendary Bob Ezrin, that worked with Pink Floyd and Alice Cooper to take them to the next level that they so desperately desired. Tension-filled studio sessions would rise, leading the band to nearly break up during the making of the record. Indulgence of drugs and alcohol from Ace Freely and Peter Chris would drive a wedge between the bandmates and created a rift that was never fully repaired. Despite the drama behind the scenes, Destroyer would prove to be just what the doctor ordered and catapulted Kiss into stardom. But today, in a retrospective review, we ask the question, does Kiss's 1976 album, Destroyer, hold up? Let's dig in. Track 1, Detroit Rock City. The track starts off with a news report about a young man who died in a head-on collision with a delivery truck while on his way to a Kiss concert. Ace's guitar solo from the Kiss Alive version of Rock and Roll All Night plays over the fast humming of a muscle car. Then, Detroit Rock City kicks in, starting with a ripping bass line and thunderous drums. Paul's vocals are in full throttle and just bleed through the speakers. This is the perfect song to serve as the starting gun to the album. I've heard the song hundreds of times over the years, and it's just as good today as it was on first listen. The guitar solo that dissolves into the song's final stanza is a classic lick and is the perfect bridge over to the impending doom of the song's conclusion. Detroit Rock City is a classic rock song for the ages. Track 2, King of the Nighttime World. This song has some cool parts. I like the rolling drums during the chorus, and Paul's vocals are fairly good here. But it isn't a classic Kiss song by any means, and quite honestly, listening to this song at this point in time in my life, it doesn't seem to be nearly as good as I remembered it being when I first heard the album. The lyrics are really simple, like something a middle school kid could write, and it's just more of a filler track than anything worth adding to your playlist. Track 3, God of Thunder. This is in my top 5 all-time KISS tracks. It's one of the heaviest songs the band has ever done. I'm not the biggest fan of the children's voices playing over the music at the beginning, and I typically listen to the No Effects remix available online when I want to hear this song. But Gene's vocals are just so metal here, and the guitar solo is so gritty and evil sounding. Interestingly, Paul Stanley wrote the lyrics to this track, despite Gene being chosen to sing it. Lyrically, the song is very dark and speaks out about virgin souls being taken under possession by the sounds of rock and roll. The song caused quite a bit of controversy in its day and was case A when the religious right started protesting the band. They labeled the band Knights in Satan's Service and warned their children about how listening to Kiss would leave you open to possible demonic possession. Oftentimes, Kiss's albums would be played backwards in schools and church assemblies, warning the young kids about how backward messages are present in rock music, and that's what people who have sold their souls to the devil do to make others fall prey to the same fate. But unfortunately for Kiss's detractors, the controversy only sold more albums and boosted ticket sales. Track 4, Great Expectations. This track isn't very good in my opinion. It sounds like a bad attempt at getting 70s soft rock radio play. It's just something that feels so overproduced and out of bounds from the prior tracks on the record. I get that they wanted to show some diversity on this album and prove themselves more musically over being just viewed as a gimmick live act, but that doesn't make the track good, it just makes it pretentious. I mean there is a horrid chorus background vocal that goes over church bell sounds. It's just in no way, shape, or form what I want from KISS. And considering this track follows God of Thunder, it really stalls the momentum of the album. 
track 5, Flaming Youth. This is another Paul Stanley written track that covers the feelings of teenagers. The music itself isn't bad and it's an okay song, but it feels to me like a song that was written in no time at all, just as a cheesy pop rock song aimed at the children of the 70s. Uh, nothing wrong with that, I'm not trying to be too harsh, but I guess in my view it just seems as if they were simply trying to make a statement of the moment instead of truly working on something with lasting value that will stand the test of time. Track 6, Sweet Pain. Gene Simmons handles lead vocals on this one. The song fits hand in hand with Flaming Youth and King of the Nighttime World as a pop vibe track. The guitar work shines on this track and the bass dresses it really well. The lyrics are pretty simple but it doesn't anchor the track down too far because the music itself speaks just as good as the words. Track 7, Shout It Out Loud. This song is a KISS classic, no doubt. A stadium anthem if there ever was one. This is the type of pop rock song that I enjoy from KISS. Something that's catchy, but a song that you can actually be age 10 or 50 and still dig it. That's what I've always enjoyed about KISS, and this song remains in my playlist 15 years after I first heard it. Gene and Paul have a dual vocal on this song, and it makes me wish they did that a little more often because it really works great here. Track 8, Beth. This is the only song on the album sung by Peter Chris. Beth was a smash hit ballad that won Song of the Year awards when it came out. Even though I've always preferred Kiss at their heavier side, this is a good ballad, no doubt. Once again though, I feel the studio version of the song isn't as good as some of the live versions I've heard. Maybe it's the orchestra on the album that makes it a little less to my personal taste, but without a doubt, when it comes to ballads of the 70s, this song is the top 10. And track nine, the last track on the album, Do You Love Me? The drums in the song suck me in instantly, and Paul's vocals convey the pure confidence that the band had at this point in time. It just drips off the song. For as simple as the song appears on the surface, it really has lasting value, where to my ears, I don't get sick of it. I can listen to the song and appreciate it each time I hear it rather than feel like it's grown stale. It's a pretty good song to conclude the record. Upon release, the album would include some of the biggest songs of the band's career and launch them into mainstream success. And just a year later, they were named the biggest band in the world by Gallup's poll, selling out shows globally and having a merchandise line second to none. Destroyer gained double platinum status over the years and stands alongside Kiss Alive as one of the group's most popular albums. Final thoughts? As a longtime Kiss fan, this album is a classic, no doubt. It has some top notch songs that can be listened to time and time again. But listening to the record front to back, the album, in my view, does show its age a little bit. Some of the tracks just don't hold up, but despite the few duds, the highlights are so good that it makes up for all the blemishes. It's a classic for a reason.